All right. Well, good morning, everybody. It's good to see all of you. It's good to be seen by those of you joining with us virtually. My name is Adam Sidler. I'm the senior pastor here. And it's, uh, it's a thrill to be able to be together again uh, every Sunday. I look forward to this. Uh, actually, my favorite time of the week is from that, uh, that, that now, that 9.30 to 10 a.m. time slot where people just start filtering in and engaging and connecting with one another. I love to see that grow um, from, for that uh, 30 minutes. So uh, thank you so much for being with us here today. Um, I, if we haven't met, I would love a chance to connect with you, actually. So after the service, I'm going to be in the comments. And uh, just introduce yourself, or if I see you and I uh, don't recognize you, I may come over and introduce myself. Uh, don't run away, please. All right, uh, just take a minute. I just want to know how it is that we can support and encourage you and pray for you. Speaking of prayer, uh, in you, um, your worship um, guide, your, your uh, worship folder that was handed out to you as, as you came into the service, there's a connection card. And that can seem a little mundane. You know, you get that every week. Uh, but there's a, a real vital component of that that we don't want to miss out on. And that is how can we pray for you? How can we pray for you? So if you would take a moment sometime during the service, if you haven't yet already, and just jot down how it is that we can lift you up in prayer. We are committed and diligent in praying over every single one of those requests and needs. Um, so we do that each week. So please give us the privilege of supporting you in prayer. You can drop that off in the offering um, box at the back. It's on the wall back there. And if you didn't get a chance to um, uh, give your physical offering as well, uh, when the baskets were passed, you can certainly drop that in the box um, too. All right. Well, um, also, I wanted to mention this. Uh, just in case you're wondering, uh, Dan Hansen, our facilities manager, um, I, I have uh, asked everybody to stop asking him to do jobs because his number one priority right now is to make sure that that water for the dunk tank is warm. So... <laughs> He is, he is so focused on that, um, uh, so uh, just please, don't ask him to do anything else. Um, no, I am excited about that July 30th uh, Family Fun event, just a really low-key time for us to get together, have fun, uh, do a lot of water games, kids. We're going to have a giant um, water slip and slide, it's going to be awesome, a lot of fun. Uh, so uh, be a part of that, invite your family and friends and neighbors to that too, it'll be fun. Um, so one passage that I think is just fascinating in Scripture comes actually in uh, 1 Samuel. And in 1 Samuel, right after David defeats Goliath, there's this moment where uh, King Saul rides in, and David is in another chariot following closely behind. And we see this in 1 Samuel chapter 18. When the men were returning home after David had killed the Philistine, the women came out from all the towns of Israel to meet King Saul with singing and dancing, with joyful songs and with tambourines and lutes. And as they danced, they sang this song. They sang, Saul has slain his thousands and David his tens of thousands. And then in verse 8, it says that Saul was very angry. They have credited David with tens of thousands, he thought, but me with only thousands. What more can he get but the kingdom? And the reason I think that that is so um, critical of a passage in Scripture is because uh, it is an example of what not to do when it comes to discipleship. Discipleship is bringing others into the chariot with you. It is inviting them into the chariot and allowing them to be raised up, to be equipped, elevated, to use gifts and abilities that God has blessed them with as well. Leadership is the process, I believe, of being forgotten. It's raising and equipping others to continue the work that God has called us all to. That's something that is very, very important and passionate to me in my life. And we're going to see evidence of that here today. So uh, many of you know um, Obi, Adam Oberman. Um, so Obi is our uh, modern worship director. 
And so normally, on any given Sunday, he's up here uh, leading the modern worship team. He's been doing that now for uh, a few years uh, in various forms. Uh, but I've known Obi for 10 years. He and I have been friends. And he was actually, when I was a worship pastor at a church, uh, a bigger church out in uh, Brooklyn Park, um, he was on my worship team. We actually started at the same time. I came on on staff as worship pastor, and he joined the team as one of the uh, instrumentalists. And I just saw right away a passion, a desire to learn, a desire to grow. Those are the people that I get really excited about, people that have teachable spirits. And, and Obi has always presented himself in, in that way. And so it's been really cool over the last 10 years. I've been able to walk with him, to bring him into the chariot, and to give him opportunities to grow and to use the gifts that God has given him. And we're going to see evidence of that again here today. We are in our series, 50 weeks we're going through the book of Acts. I still can't believe that. That's just, it's awesome. We're about halfway through, if you can believe that. And um, hopefully you feel like that's still uh, a benefit to all of you, and I know it has been for me. I've been praying every day, God, send me into the harvest field, right? The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few, so send me, send me. Um, so it's been a great challenge for me. But today we're going to continue into Acts chapter 16, and our very own Adam Oberman, Obi, is going to give the message. So would you please give Obi a warm round of applause. Good morning, everybody. How are we doing? All right. Well, as Pastor Adam had said, uh, my name is also Adam, uh, Adam Oberman, or Obi, as I'm often known here, uh, to make things a little less confusing. And uh, again, welcome to North Haven Church. Uh, we are so glad that you are here this morning, and those of you who are joining us online, uh, this is definitely a place that you can call home. And like Adam said, I've been the worship director here for uh, the past three years or so in some capacity or another, and um, this morning, again, to, just to reiterate what he said, I get to preach to you for the very first time in my life, uh, which isn't scary at all, right? <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, I'm, I couldn't be more honored about the opportunity to do that. So I want to share a little bit before I get started about my family. Those of you who may not know me that well, um, uh, I have another job. Um, for the past 10 years or so, I've been working, uh, wiring new houses, uh, new homes for people. I'm an electrician. Um, so if you ever need any work done, don't call me. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, but uh, I, I love what I do. I, I love that God has opened that door for me and given me a set of skills that I can use uh, daily. Uh, my beautiful wife, Brianna, some of you may know, she unfortunately couldn't be here this morning because she just got off of her job. She works nights at uh, Maple Grove Hospital. She's a NICU charge nurse, and she takes care of all the sick babies there and uh, kind of helps their families deal with, with what is obviously a, a very hard time. Um, I have two wonderful children. Uh, Ezra, my son, is six years old. He is my pride and joy. I love him so much. And then I have my wonderful yet bossy little four-year-old, Sloane. And if any of you have ever met her, you know what I mean. And uh, we live in Brooklyn Park, and we have, uh, we have two dogs, two bulldogs, uh, Thor and Wanda. They are a handful, just like having more kids. But that's a story of its own. So this morning, I, I want to begin with a question. I want to I ask you guys to think back on your life, perhaps when you were fresh out of high school, maybe when you were in college, um, and I want you to think of what was your dream? What was something that you wanted to do? Perhaps you wanted to be a writer. Maybe you wanted to be ambitious and climb Mount Everest. Uh, perhaps you wanted to move out to New York or Los Angeles and be a famous superstar, right? Well, I also had dreams, like anybody else. When I was in my early 20s, um, I had one purpose in life, and that was I wanted to be a rock star. Not a rock rock star, but you know what I mean. Um, and so I, I had pursued uh, starting a band. I wanted to play music. I wanted to write music. I wanted people to experience uh, what I felt uh, every time that I had the opportunity to do that. And so my best friend and I from high school, we, we had worked for many years trying to start a band, and after many failed attempts, we had all but given up. 
And we finally caught a break. We found three guys who were exactly what we needed. The catch was, they were in Texas. Yeah, ooh. They were halfway across the country. And so, being in my early 20s, I didn't have a lot of money, but I knew that God had opened this door for a reason. And so we, we prayed about it, and we went down there for a week-long trial run. And what we discovered was, uh, we wrote a couple of songs and, you know, things just started to kind of click. And so we made the decision to move down there. We had, like I said, very little funds. We had no jobs. We had no place to live. A parent's worst nightmare for their child, right? But we did it anyway. You know, we went down there and we, we, we fulfilled our calling. And we got down there and things started to move very quickly. We, we wrote a bunch of songs. It seemed effortless. It was very easy. And I thought for the briefest of moments, I said, wow, we did it. We actually did it. Like, here I am living my dream. This is going to be awesome. Nope. That's not what the Holy Spirit had in mind. And so he went on to open another door for me. He closed that door. He opened up another door, one that I would not have seen or even chosen for myself. So what ended up happening? Well, the band ended up breaking up after our couple shows, and I was devastated, of course, but I learned one valuable truth throughout all of it, and then that, that was God would always see me through. Amen? So over the past six months, as Adam had said, we are, uh, we're going through the book of Acts, and uh, in this 50-week series, it has methodically brought us to chapter 16, and, you know, if you, have, if you have your Bibles, would you go ahead and open them up to Acts chapter 16? If you don't, that's okay, too. The verses are going to be on the screens here behind me. Uh, you can also use your phone uh, if you have the Bible app as well. And we're going to notice something here. We're going to notice that the book of Acts is going to start to pick up pace. This journey that we're on is going to start to go faster and faster, and that's because we're following one of the busiest guys in the ancient world, and that is the Apostle Paul. In Acts 15, we saw Paul and Barnabas back in their home church in Antioch, and they were about to set, on, set sail on their journey. They were going to go back to the churches that they had started. They were going to give support and encouragement and, and you know, just see how they, could, how they could help them and check in on them. And then we see what Luke describes as a, quote, sharp disagreement between Paul and Barnabas. And this sharp disagreement was, of course, that as we discovered last week, that Barnabas wanted to take Mark with them on their journey, and Paul didn't think that that was a good idea. So they ended up going their separate ways. So Barnabas took Mark, and he sailed off for Cyprus, and, and Paul and Silas, they went north to Derby and to Leicester, and that's where we pick up our story this morning. So again, Acts chapter 16, starting at verse 1, if you would read on with me, it says this, it says, Paul came to Derby and then to Lystra where a disciple named Timothy lived, whose mother was Jewish and a believer, and whose father was a Greek. The believers at Lystra and Iconium spoke well of him. Paul wanted to take him along on the journey, so he circumcised him because of the Jews who lived in that area, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. As they traveled from town to town, they delivered the decisions reached by the apostles and elders in Jerusalem for the people to obey. And so the churches grew in strength and faith, and they grew daily in numbers. Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. And when they came back to the border of Mysia, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. So they passed by Mysia and went down to Troas. Verse 9, during the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. All right, now today we're going to spend the bulk of our time focusing on verses 6 through 10. But in order to get a good foothold and a foundation of where we're going and where we've been, we need to break down and address some things that beginning in the verses, starting with verse 1. It says, Paul came to Derby and then to Lystra, where a disciple named Timothy lived, whose mother was Jewish and a believer, but whose father was a Greek. 
See, Paul had had so much success in his first journey to this region, so much so that it was five years between his trips back and forth. But why go back after five years? You see, Paul was an absolute savant when it came to identifying leaders, equipping them for the business of preaching the resurrected gospel, the resurrected Jesus. And yet we see this played out again in the opening verses of Acts 16. There was one main reason that Paul went back to Derby and Lystra, and the answer was Timothy. Yes, this is the same Timothy with whom Paul wrote the two letters in the New Testament. Paul saw a passion in this young man who loved Jesus, and he said, I want you on my team. Let's look at verse 4. It says, as they traveled from town to town, they delivered the decisions reached by the apostles and elders in Jerusalem for the people to obey, so the church was strengthened in faith and grew daily in numbers. So what decisions are we talking about here? Pastor Adam addressed this two weeks ago when we looked at Acts chapter 15, 23 through 29, and we discovered in that chapter the brewing disagreement amongst the church leaders as whether Gentile followers had to be circumcised like the Jews were required to be. And in that disagreement, Peter underlined the preeminent distinction of the Christian faith. It says in Acts 15, verse 11, it is through grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved. So there it is. It was confirmed, right? Works don't save. Only grace through our faith in the risen Jesus does. The next step the church leaders took after having confirmed this role of grace was to send out a statement to the Gentile Jesus followers that these were the decisions delivered by Paul to the churches mentioned here in verse 4. And it's also in this passage that we see the results of that letter that was sent out. So the stage has been set, right? Paul has his team. He has Silas. He has Timothy. He's been fueled by his calling. He's ready to go. And he's excited. Can you imagine how stoked Paul must have been? His team was rock solid. He had not a single doubt in his mind about what his calling was. I don't know about you, but if that had been me, I probably would have thought to myself, there is not a thing on this planet that could stop me now. That is. Except the Holy Spirit, right? Let's take a look at verses 6 through 8 again. It says, Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. When they came to the border of Mysia, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. So they passed by Mysia and went down to Troas. All right, so wait a second. What is going on here? In verse 6, the Holy Spirit forbade Paul from preaching the gospel. Don't you think that's strange? That was the sole purpose of the church, was it not? To spread the gospel of the resurrected Christ? So why would he prohibit him from preaching? I mean, this is crazy. This is a guy that had a desire to share the gospel. It was the good news of the resurrected Christ, an event that no doubtedly changed human history. And yet, this is how the Spirit guided them. Now, Luke doesn't specify here. He doesn't say how the Holy Spirit clarified this to Paul. It could have been through a word, a voice, or obvious circumstances that were impossible to ignore. And again, if it had been me, I probably would have been a little surprised at first. Like, are we supposed to do this or not? But then I would have continued on with my team, knowing that God had called us. But then it happens again in verse 7. Paul and his companions tried again to go into Bethany, but the Holy Spirit would not allow them to. Could you imagine Paul's frustration at this point? I mean, for the past handful of years, here's a guy who's been telling everybody about the gospel. They started churches. They traveled around the entire region together. They had so much success, and they're trying to spread the life-giving message that Jesus had given them, and they were denied again. This is where many of us would probably diverge from what Paul did. Again, if it had been me, I, I probably would have been tempted to give up. You know, maybe my team isn't 
as good as I thought they were. Maybe this wasn't my God-given calling. Or maybe God's playing games with me. But Paul, undeterred, faithfully changes course. And instead he goes to Troas. So we're going to stop here for a moment. We're going to focus on three important truths that are tied into that that we need to pay attention to this morning. And the first one is this. The Holy Spirit is in the business of closing doors more than he is opening them. Let me say that again. The Holy Spirit is in the business of closing doors more than he is opening them. See, the Holy Spirit will always faithfully tell you where to go by telling you where not to go. The Holy Spirit is often the one that will close the door. In verses 6 and 7, we see the Holy Spirit closing not one, but two doors for Paul and his companions. They tried to go down to the province of Asia, and God said no. They tried to go into Bithynia, and God said no. A few years ago, as Adam had mentioned, when I came here to North Haven Church, um, the church was in transition, uh, and he had asked me to come to be the interim worship director. And I prayed about this, and I wrestled with it, and, you know, was, God, is this something that you're calling me to do? Is this something you want me to do? Leave my other church, uh, all my friends, and, and come here and, and to do this. And um, the more I prayed, the more I realized the Holy Spirit was saying, yes, uh, I want you to go. And so when we came here, we began to experience tremendous blessings a couple of months before COVID began, leadership decided to combine the modern and the classic worship positions into one. And again, I was forced with a decision, a choice, right? I asked God, I said, is this something you want me to do? Do you want me to throw my hat in the ring in this? And I got a different answer this time. Holy Spirit was saying, not yet. You know what I did? How I responded to that? I threw up my hands in desperation, I fell to my knees, and I wrestled with God. I went into that season with one question, and I said, why? God, why would you lead me here? Why would you have me follow you through this door only to close it again? I don't understand. The more I prayed the more I kept hearing the Holy Spirit say, not yet. And this was hard because I had such a a deep passion for worship, but I've also grown to love you guys. North Haven Church had become my new family. So just like we talked about the first thing, the Holy Spirit is in the business of closing doors more than he is opening them. But the second truth, which is just as important, is the Holy Spirit always has another door that's open for you. There's always an open door. See, I didn't have eyes to see it at the time, but just over a little over a year later, I was offered the modern worship director position here at North Haven. Now, I had no idea that this would transpire. I can't see the future. But I knew two things. One, I've been given gifts and talents by God with the passion to use them. And two, a desire to be a conduit through which people could experience joy, love, and connection that comes from heartfelt worship. See, the Holy Spirit closed the door, but a different door remained open the whole time. The very same thing happened with Paul and his companions. Again, the Holy Spirit closed not one, but two doors. But as the Holy Spirit faithfully does, He had another one open for Paul to walk through. Let's check out what it says here in verse 9. It says, During the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen a vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. See, in Troas, the Holy Spirit made Paul's path very clear. And they went to Macedonia. And this is the first time that the gospel had been brought into the region that is now known as Europe. So you can already see the connection here. God forbid them from going to Asia, right? And then he forbid them from going to Bithynia so that they could bring the gospel 
to Europe. How cool is that? The parallels there. When the Holy Spirit revealed to Paul the open door, he didn't hesitate, but instead he walked through it faithfully. Those of you who know me uh, know that I am a huge superhero fan. I love superheroes, and no, not because of all the, the rage of the movies and the TV shows and everything else. I was a superhero fan long before that. And I love, I love all superheroes. I love Marvel, I love DC, I love them everything. But my all-time favorite superhero, it's not Superman, it's not Batman, it's Thor. You know, the, the guy with the hammer, you know? And, you know, I, 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 I love Thor. I, you know, I may have Thor's long, long hair. I have yet to attain this physique. I'm still working that one out. I might be a while. But Thor is a powerful superhero nonetheless. I think we, those of you, would, we could all agree on that. My children that I mentioned earlier, Ezra and Sloan, at six and four, see, they are, they are curious about the world and everything in it. And as such, they're prone to walking into possible dangerous situations from time to time. And it's in those times that my wife or I get to be the superhero, right? And we do this because we can see things that they cannot, and we do our best to keep them safe and on the correct path. Similarly, the Holy Spirit sees things that we cannot see, and as such, we can trust him in the same manner. Now, I don't demand that my children know everything, all the pitfalls and trials and reasons to do something or not to do something. But I do want them to trust me that I know what's best for them, that I will steer them and lead them on the correct path and take them where they need to go. So again, as we talked about, let's recap this. So again, the Holy Spirit is in the business of closing doors more than he is opening them, right? Right? The second truth, which is just as important, the Holy Spirit always has another door that's open. And that brings us to our third and final truth this morning, and that is the Holy Spirit deserves your trust as you faithfully follow his leading through the open door. Trust. It's such a key component here. Trust that the Holy Spirit will open that door for you. And when he does... You can faithfully walk through. See, the Holy Spirit, again, he closed doors for Paul and his companions, but there was always an open door. They just couldn't see it. And once the Holy Spirit revealed it to them, they didn't hesitate, and they walked right through. See, the Holy Spirit sees what we cannot see, right? His plans are not our plans. And we wrestle with that. We struggle with that. But most importantly, when a door closes, we can trust him that another door is waiting. So where are you this morning? Are you standing in front of a closed door? And if you are, how are you responding to this? Are you banging on the door demanding to be let through? Or perhaps you're collapsed in a ball on the floor, determined not to move. Or do you believe that there is an open door that's waiting for you, one that God has called you to, and the Holy Spirit has had for you all along? You see, he isn't playing hide and seek. This isn't a game to the Holy Spirit. He wants to reveal that door to you. It is his desire to do that. And we must pray that we would have the eyes to see it. And when he does, we could faithfully walk through. For those of you who are standing in front of a closed door, I get it. I've been there. I've stood stubbornly in front of a closed door. The Holy Spirit is closed, feeling restless and angry and agitated. And like me, you know that there's something more for you. Where you are now is not where you want to stay. I want to encourage you to do something. Those of you standing in front of a closed door, that you would open up your hearts and your minds to what the Holy Spirit is saying to you. Because it's the same thing that he was saying to Paul. It's the same thing that he said to me, and it's the same thing that he's saying to you right now. 
As a matter of fact, I want you to do something for me right now. I want, you, I want all of you to close your eyes. And I want you to imagine for a second. I want you to imagine this, okay? I want you to imagine the Holy Spirit telling you this. I know what's best for you. I will not fail you. Where you want to go and what you want to do is not what I want for you. It's not what I've called you to. And because of that, I've closed this door. But don't despair. Because I've always had an open door for you. It's a door that I have for you and for my purpose. Trust me. Follow my leading. And when I bring you to the open door, walk through it. Father, Lord, Lord God, I thank you for today. Lord, I thank you that we have an opportunity to, to come to you, Lord, that we can trust in your leading, Lord, that we would not be deterred by a circumstance or anything else, Father, that we would be able to wholeheartedly take your hand and trust your leading. God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would just immerse this room this morning, Lord, that you would touch everyone's hearts, Lord, that you would be able to begin to speak to them, Father. And that they would be able to trust you. God, we thank you for this time that we have together this morning. We pray all these things in your name. Amen. Amen. God, that is who you are. You are a way maker. Lord, when things seem hopeless, Lord, that there is always an open door. We thank you for that. As we close out this service, as we have been doing for the last uh, six months or so, we're going to say our creed together. So say this with me. We are the church. We have received power from the Holy Spirit. We are Jesus' witness to the world. We will give the love of Jesus to each other, to our community, and to the ends of the earth because we are the church. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you guys so much for joining us this morning. Again, I am so honored to have had the opportunity to preach this morning. And uh, if I had not met you, uh, I would love a chance to do that. I'll be out there in the commons. I would love to meet you and say hello. And uh, we hope you have a blessed week. We'll see you back here next week. God bless.